Was haben wir da bis jetzt? Ah, okay, okay. So wird gesagt. Um, Schauen wir uns hier mal die Agenda. We'll make it a little bit of a talking talk thing first. We'll tell you about what and how we do. Um, I'll give a live packaging demo, just to put some concrete examples into what I'm going to say. And then it'll turn hopefully into a fruitful discussion about the various challenges that we have at the Haskell and Debian and possible solutions. And I have four or five bullet points for that, but we can also discuss other things. Um, we have people watching us from IRC, uh, from Germany, who got up early, or stayed up late, I don't know, for that. So I'd be happy if someone could volunteer to relay questions from IRC. So, so uh, well, I don't know if I'm assuming they're in English. Mm, yeah. cool. Okay, so just make sure you, whatever IRC people want to tell them, reach us. This is on the DevCon channel. On the room channel. The room channel, I should log in there. Um, also, somebody who would like to take notes and send them to the Debbie has to make this afterwards just to use the summary. Uh, Alrighty, yeah, like for those who want to stand up and talk into this, if you're going to talk for the stream. Yeah, that's great. There's only me, so it's hard. Alright, so I need, uh, I guess one of us closer than the team members would like to send a little mail to this afterwards about what we did. So again, same time frame, last six months, I was comparing the number of uploads 
with a number of persons according to this, this criterion. Uh, and by that, we are the most productive or most efficient team. So we have 56 uploads per maintainer in this time frame. Um, and that's the average across all 12 that we just saw on the table. That's slightly better than what Package Pro and what the QG team does. And, um, yeah, that doesn't far off. Which might be that they, because they have more people. Um, if this is not a completely qualitative thing to say. So for, for those who are not already packaging Haskell libraries, what's special about Haskell packages and compared to others? Uh, first of all, they are very homogeneous. So there's very little variation in how the packages look like, where you find the metadata, how you build them. Uh, basically, it's declarative. Okay, for the anything. So we have a package that should just show one of these packages. Um, so let's use Cabal, which is the upstream package manager, to get one of these. And we see there's um, some text files, and most important is this Cabal file, which is a, looks a bit like a Debian control file, which makes me feel a bit old. Um, and it has things like license information, version, dependencies, and contents of the module. And then there's, of course, the source as well. So we come back to that. Um, this is good because it allows us to spend little time on the individual package, because there's a little less surprise. And then the other thing that also helps a lot is a property of the language itself. If it compiles, it works. So most of the problems that, that we would face, like incompatibilities between various packages and versions, are handled by the compiler. So I, I'm reasonably confident my change to packages are OK if all the packages still compile. Um, we do run some test suites where they are in the packages. Um, so we do have that as well. But yes. it, again, it takes away the responsibility to do a comprehensive test after each build. Because the kind of bugs that you would expect caused by mistakes in maintaining are those that co the compiler would um, catch and would tell you about. So these are the upsides of packaging Haskell packages. There are downsides in a way as well. The first one is this metadata that, just, that I've just shown you. Um, here's this again. Um, and you see it's, it's relatively detailed. It only says what packages this depends on, but rather a very precise range of versions that this is known to work. And then um, the, the main school of how to do this in Haskell is to be rather conservative. So they use an upper bound if they know something would break afterwards, but if they don't know that it would not break, I won't look to um, So if I were to upgrade now DLIS to version 0 0.8, I could not compile this package anymore without changing the package and patching. Uh, this is annoying. What's even more annoying is if they don't put it in there, I upgrade the 0 .8, and then it breaks. Although all the metadata that we have was indicating that it will not break. Um, we are relying on it, not for correctness but for efficiency. So we, we can slow down any problems and, and these are actually not concerned. But that's something that's not too commonly seen in other um, packages. And then the other thing, um, we have basically no ADI stability. What this means is if I change dependencies, if I were to change uh, DLIS from 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, I would have to recompile this section to look at right now. And all data on dependencies. Uh, so the call is on something packages, so I have an updated package very high in the tendency tree, cross downwards, very low levels, um, then I might have to rebuild 100 or 200 packages. And of course, that requires tooling automation. Uh, we have that to uh, quite a extent, so it's, it's not a big deal anymore. It used to be much more difficult when Monitor didn't know about insolvability of those dependencies. And, um, package vulnerabilities have to be manually uh, uploaded, manually signed by the, the admin 
and all these kind of manual work. So in a sense, um, I think that one can say that the challenges that Haskell has for Debian make Debian improve its infrastructure because it's not up to it, or it was not up to it at this point, and then we had to prove it, and other parts of Debian benefit from that. So that's my excuse for getting a one aspect of Debian. Um, which I can understand if they would. Okay, so let's have a look at, at how our work as a Debian hanging on uh, looks like. Um, these are roughly the steps I would do when I um, and I have to package a new package. So what does this mean? Um, this package plan, I'll come to back to it um, later in detail, but let's have a quick look. It's basically a repository here. Um, it has a file called packages.txt. Uh, uh, the font size in Vim is always... Yeah, that's why I don't use gvim, I use vim when doing presentations. Um, this is large enough. Okay, so basically you see the list of packages and version numbers, and now I also want to package globe uh, in version C075. It's not yet in Debian, so I want to package it. I want to have this sorted. Um, and then I have a little, well, not so little anymore, program that now verifies that this plan of changing Debian packages makes sense in terms of all the intermediate dependencies between the packages. So if Glob were to depend on something that we wouldn't have in Debian yet, we would get a complaint in a few seconds. Um, but it says, well, that is that, it's a bug, but a diff problem, provide one. Uh, yeah, no error on the report, so we're fine. And you can see that it, it tells me that I've added Glob to the plan, but it's not in the archive, so basically that's how I do this. So this was step one. Step two is to use the template, Debian directory, and adjust it. Okay, let's do that. Um, I go to the... Can you explain what the script did? The kind of big steps? Or are you gonna yeah, I'll, I'll come back to the package then later. I'll have a separate section for that. Um, I just want to do a demo for us. I guess I should watch the time. Um, so I'll create a directory for Haskell Blob. So this is named by the Debian source package name. Um, I guess I'll do a different name. So we have a tool like this. Uh, we have a template directory that we can use. Um, that yeah. has um, a change log, a combat file, a control file, a copyright file, a rules file, a source directory, and a watch file. So what I use to use is just edit, edit one, of, one of them, one after another. So I, the version number is 075, so I put that in the manually. Um, I will have to change foo quite often now to blob. So I do that. But I don't bother with um, ITPs, it's just too much work. And this is me now. That's it for this file. We don't have to change this. And this file this is the main work, well, mostly the main work. Um, uh, I need to adjust the dependencies. So we have a template here for bindings that would depend on C libraries. This is not one of these, so we don't need that. I don't need this comment, it's just a reminder. Oh, I should have changed this one. And I usually do it first because then, yeah, um, then I, I usually use the dot in Vim to do the same thing. Um, so I have to type it twice. But, yeah. So now the dependencies. Uh, for these, I have to um, look at this file. I know by heart by now which packages are provided by the compiler itself, that space and containers and directory. Uh, so I just need to put dependencies on DList, file path. That's file path all provided by the TC, so there's two dependencies, DList and Transformers. So I will put them in here. And I, this is how it's being mapped to. Um, Debian package names. And I also have to carry over the um, version page. That's very important. So it's from 04 to 48 exclusively. So it's good like this. And then the same thing for Transformers. And this is from 02 to 06. 
And then we have the description. We have a little feature here that we have the description once in the source um, sensor of the control file because we reuse it with different several packages. And then here, this actually does have to change. So anything from down here is identical for all our packages. Um, you should, when we're lucky, we can take the description from here. Here's a bit short, but I guess it's for this package, it's all right. Um, so I'll put this in the short description. The long description is uh, very beautifully uh, Esco. Uh, <laughs> this package contains a Esco library for clocking. Because you know the, the policy that the long description has to be usable independent of the short one. So this is, I guess, a good one. Otherwise, it wouldn't take a 700 things. Now, this is a line part, copyright files. I find that we um, spend too much time on them for too little value. So, there should be. I would think we could use a little ease in what we expect to, to here, have here. So, for the license, you just copy there. Um, in this case, a bit more complicated because they didn't put the copyright in the license file, so I'll have to. Copyright in, um, in this other file that we have. That's good. Unusual credits. Um, these are the two people that have quick credits, so I have to put them here. And I don't actually know who benefits from me putting this information there. Seriously. But that's okay. Um, I can live with um, endeavoring to live with things that you don't find. It would turn fully agree on And it's already 204 by now. And then I have to indent this, so this works using this little line and we are done. Uh, there are no tests in this file, so I don't even bother with any of them here. And we also have to change the watch file. That's it. Um, so let's um, put this into a Dax repository. And um, we can build. So to build it, I have some automation that helps me in managing several packages. So I take this for to, for I take this for release, and I can take it so at the same time this way. And then I can mass build it. Um, it's a bit much to say mass build just for a uh, single package, but we can do it. So this will now um, take the static on the directory. Um, oh, yeah. Glob is a tricky thing. We might remember that the upstream name had a capital G. So in this case, the watch file has to, has to refer to a capital G, otherwise it doesn't work. So let's amend my patch. And try to build it. Okay, um, I need to build and, and make it build. So while this is building, um, it's here, so we've done all this. Um, notice that Debian rule says modified, this is good, so there's very little entropy in our control files, in our Debian directories at all. Even. So that's a uh, big plus. And I guess you could even do this as well. Um, we did that, uh, this is happening right now, and then I have to take and push the tag. And there's also scripts available now, tools repository to do this a bit more efficiently. Um, so it's still building. So let's have a look in parallel what ha happens if you want to upgrade a new package. Um, it's a bit similar. <coughs> so again, we start by updating the package plan. And this is a bit more interesting this time. So where's our package plan? So that, these are upgrades that we need for um, anyway, so let's try to I want to upgrade math functions from the latest version. This is upstream, this is hackage where we get our source from. Notice a nice feature here that it tells us, or it tells especially the users, that this package is all available in Debian in this version. But as you can see, this is not the latest version, so we want to go to the latest version in Debian. So let's um, try to upgrade my functions to this version. And I run this um, test packages script. And it will not verify that we can upgrade up safely to this version without breaking anything. At least according to the metadata. 
and it will tell us that uh, we can, but that we have pulled in an additional dependency. So this is a new package that this new version depends on it, therefore we also need living. So I'll add this to the file and sort. And now it should go through. Um, so let's go. Yeah. We successfully built package block and we will go to the upload together with the other packages in a moment. So let's see what we have to do. We have updated the package plan in the new version. We fixed any breakers, so that was the second step. This is important. We always want the package plan to be consistent. Now we actually have to do the update of the packaging. <coughs> so for that, um, my functions. Um, I have a little script that's yeah. oh, it's not in the path anymore. Wait. Yeah, there you go. Um, it generates. Uh, okay. um, sorry. What I want to say is um, something else, a very cool thing, it imported all package into Git repositories. Um, so now this means I can construct a URL that gives me the list between other two versions on package. So I can do the package review without even downloading stuff. <laughs> and in the script, already figured out what is my version and what's the latest version. So I just ran this command. It's always my history. And this has been working for a few weeks. Um, and I get this. I can now review the changes. Um, sometimes they have change logs. Unfortunately, very rarely. Change logs seems to be uncommon in Haskell world. This is not nice. Um, yeah, I can, I can look. Yeah, looks like they had the tests, which is nice. And of course, I'm mostly interested in the changes to the metadata. Um, because this will tell me how the build dependencies have changed. For example, we see that there's a new one. User. This means I will have this available when I now do the changes here. So I do um, mass upgrade, which basically just figure out the version number. So I don't have to type it and adds the change log entry. And then I modify the control file. Uh, this is not up to date anymore. We don't need this anymore. And we know that it has changed. Um, Oh yeah, this is a new dependency, of course. Um, would be strange if that were not there. So we also want to depend on vector th unbox in an arbitrary version. Okay, if upstream thinks that's fine, then let's hope that he's right. And this is strangely formatted. Let's fix this. And we also want to add the documentation package. Uh, the version ranges didn't change, but we also have a new dependency on on DeepSec, which is another small, many of these small packages. So we also put this in here. Sorry. Um, okay, this should be enough to do this upgrade. You're, then, missing, you're missing a comment after Prof. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was um, Another one? No, okay. That would have given me an annoying error message later, so thank you. Um, uh, ah, yeah. I guess put in here so it doesn't happen next time. This is also valid, so this is just more consistent. Then I amend the new upstream release that my script just created. And I take this for release. Now if I now, if I now say mass build Haskell math functions, it will tell me um, after creating the source package that it can't build it. Because obviously at a new dependency, we haven't packaged that yet. Um, and this is using either set check or dose set check these days. It will also detect that the other parameter I gave, my hypothesis, has to block, is already built. So it says, I don't need to build this package, and, yeah, that is another one, and this is not build one. Now I've prepared the other one, um, the Haskell vector th unbox. So I just mass release it, which takes it for release. Um, and add this to this command line, and you can imagine that this works well for like tens and dozens of packages um, that I have to upgrade simultaneously. Okay, so now this should now build them in the right order and make sure that they can they are built with each other. Um, this is using S builder in case you are interested, um, or just very small package scripts that happen to be very useful. Um, 
So um, we'll just run over a little bit a moment. Um, and later, because remember the ABI instability, I'll have to check if any packets have become unsolvable and schedule any use for that. Uh, since two days, we have a new tool for that, and it looks like uh, this. It's a cron shop and Kubernetes org that generates a file like this, and it will go through all the packages, see what needs to be done, and give me a suitable report. Currently, everything is commented out because we don't have anything to do right now. Um, if we had something, it would appear there, and I just pipe it to one of them. For those who know what one of them is, for those who don't, don't worry. It's important for you, I guess. Um, it also means the packages are unsolvable. In Debian, you can look at this page, and if there are things, there are things to do, you can nudge me to apply them. It's a bit transparent now than used to be. And you can also see what, what is failed, um, like Criterion. Criterion fails a bit from source because its metadata was not precise, and the uploads I'm doing right now will help us towards fixing this. And I would have fixed it a few days earlier as so it wouldn't have wanted the uploads to do now as a demonstration. So this is um, step six. Let's see how our uploads are doing. Okay, we are building already math functions. It is built now. And um, I think that should be done. So yeah, it keeps upgrading the change route because I build new packages. And we are we go. okay. So let's talk about this um, package plan. I think this is one of the unique, most unique things that we do compared to other people in Debian, so this might be interesting for other maintainers as well. So we've, we've seen that it contains um, basically a list of packages and versions. Can you tell a bit more? Sometimes there are attributes that we use, such as um, a binary, for example. This means it doesn't produce as a library, so it needs different ways to figure out version number in Debian and also needs to find out the package name. Is that a question? Yeah, we have a question for yes. Myers, So Crimson Bits would like to know why you added deep sec. Okay, I guess I could just simply do this. Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Uh, oh, that's not easy. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Why did you put DeepSec in the build depends when it's provided by GSC? Anyway, I thought it wasn't. Maybe the, I think it has changed someday. Okay, sorry, my bad. It used to be a separate package, but anymore. It doesn't work in this case because the dependency is not versioned, so it'll do the right thing. If it were a version dependency, we would get a build dependence unsolvable, and I would notice I could fix it. So currently it just doesn't matter. Uh, um, but otherwise, you would notice the breakage. So it's not, uh, nothing critical. But um, well spotted. Okay. Um, okay, successfully built. And now what I do now is um, mass upload. And it'll upload the changes, push the tags push the changes, make sure I take it. Um, people sometimes forget to tag things and it's confusing for other developers. And, oh, I didn't, I didn't yeah, my bad. Um, okay, I forgot to, to actually push the repository first to any of the bits. Um, Don't you test it before the build? Well, as I said, <laughs> 30 close. <laughs> um, okay, so this, usually this would work, but let's just um, continue this point. But I think I'm, I want to give you an impression of how I'm managing these packages. Doesn't have to be the, the best way, but it maybe explains how we can manage 700 packages with mostly two people. And I guess Clint might be using some other tools. I don't know. Um, but we can talk about it also later. Okay, so back to the package plan. So we have this metadata there. Um, we also have attributes that are we? Yeah. Um, <coughs> For example, no test means that we don't run test suite because maybe it's dependencies are not something you want to run or because the test suite is stupid or something else. Um, we can add flags, which are like configure flags um, here and it will apply them correctly. Uh, and then there are things like ignore that will make us temporarily ignore a package. Then what, what happens then is that the script will read available packages from the and will read available package from Cabal, or from Hackage. We compare to the list and report anything that's out of date, that's 
for example, where Debian has a version newer than in the package plan, which is not, not allowed by our policy. Um, and then we will make sure that they're consistent. And this check is being done by the actual Cabal install program that everybody else besides us uses to install Haskell packages. So it constructs a command line that looks like this, which basically installs all the packages with the right flags, in the right version, um, and sometimes disabling tests or enabling them. And it's quite a long command line. Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess I should just do this. Uh, it's um, 63 kilobytes command line. Yeah. But it, it works. It works. Hmm? Yeah, it works fine. Just, you just can't, the problem is you, you can't debug it by looking at prop um, kit command line because that's limited to one kilobyte. Um, that's why I have to write it out <laughs> to, to debug it. Um, but yeah, it works. This is every package you have. Every has package. Yeah. 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 Um, what it also does, it allows us to patch things. So we have a, basically a copy of all our patches, at least those that affect the metadata, in uh, this tree. And you can see that it's a, you can actually just copy all of the patches file because it's a Quill compatible um, format. So yay for, the, for Debian patches and yay for Quill. Whatever way you package your packages, make sure that they end up with a nice patch series. Um, I can also add cabal files there that are not upstream, or so I should do this way. Um, for example, that block tail is being, so that means it's a fork, so this package is not in there yet. Um, Lens is a package that is on hackage, but has been modified in the metadata by hackage, so that the cabal file that hackage reports differs from the cabal file in the table. They do that so they can update metadata later. It's a new feature. It's great. It's just annoying for us. So whenever that happens, we have to fetch the original one and copy it here so they have it available. Um, the package plan. Yeah, and, and we've seen it test the instability. It's also run by Jenkins. So the, we have a set of Jenkins jobs. One of them is the package plan. And we can see that um, it's currently succeeding. Yay. Um, and if not, we get a mail. So let's make sure that, we, that this invariant is preserved that I mentioned earlier. Um, I go quickly through that. We have a few more tools. We have a package entropy tracker. A package entropy tracker. It's something that the package probe team had first, I think. And it gives an overview about the relation <coughs> the status of the packages in the VCIs, about upstream, about possible changes. It needs love. Um, I, don't think, I think it has been running unmodified for years, and I'm lucky that it's running at all, but I think somebody should take care of it. I also have the impression that the PAT team itself is kind of dormant, so it's a pity, it's a useful tool. Um, so if somebody feels working on this, that would be great. Then I've already talked about building scheduling. I've just shown you the package job. There are further jobs that install all hackage packages. The job that tries to install all packages um, in unstable has been failed for three months or for four months for various varying reasons. So sometimes it was a package that had to be removed that wasn't removed by three months, and sometimes it was something that we didn't fix in time. So this is a bit unfortunate, but at least. Um, yeah, currently the only error that shows is the criterion error. That's the one I, that I could have, could have fixed a few days before. So maybe that's good thing we know about um, The others are usually green, which is installing unstable, upgrading to testing, and installing to testing. And these are not useful. These are experiments. Uh, some of our packages have auto package tests. Um, if you've seen the last talk, yay for auto package tests. And you've all seen that. Um, package knows about all versions. That's a script I run on people that need to go in a crunch shop. So I'm one of us. Somebody will have to figure out how to do that. But I, that's a typical living problem. I guess it could document it somewhere. <coughs> document it somewhere, just hard to find. All right, so that took me a little bit longer than expected, but I hope it's still good insight and good starting point for the discussion. So these are some of the challenges that I have numbers for them um, that I think we could discuss. There's a question there. Uh, 
uh, just before uh, the different sources, there's also uh, a history page on the, uh, the transition tracker. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, you can see the installed or not installed packages. <laughs> it's updated uh, every hour. So uh, it's there. Right. Uh, this one is the very version of spoke, I think. You just have to free account uh, TLDmatic on the network. And you have the version of the program that will be deployed to the end of the So, which of course is less. Yeah, and all the more records. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I just forgot about it when I was playing with it. I am using this. Um, okay, so I. Uh, yeah, please. Um, we just need to be better at telling you how it can be improved. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not the perfect thing yet for us. But it's, um, I guess, there's improvement there, so I'll make sure I use it more. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, so the first question is basically, what should we pick it? Oh yeah, um, another point there? Yeah. And just a question about library versions. You, you seem to pretty much just have the latest version of everything. Do you find that works? That you know, enough people are writing Haskell programs to make sure their programs work with the latest version of the library? Because in Java we have the problem that, you know, if you were trying to package every dependency, we'd end up with 16 versions of the same library, which you can't at the same time because right. it's not that. And you can mention yourself that you know, ABI stability. So. So, so we have a policy of having one version of each package. It works okay-ish. We will see in a moment, it's two sides of that, where it doesn't work very well. Um, yeah, we, we sometimes can't upgrade to the latest version of something, because it requires an older version of something else. Or it is, no, it's because it requires an older version by something else. But there's, there's movement in the Hess community to always be compatible with the latest version. There are tools that check it there, like continuous integration tools for that, that people can opt into. Um, we can maybe push that part of the upstream and encourage them to use these tools. Um, we rarely have the situation where we actually need to package two versions of the library yet. We had it in the past. I don't know if it was actually required, but just preemptive. Um, problem avoiding for classic and for quick check. Um, yeah, but usually it works okay. So, this I think an important point we've discussed is what should we package at all and related to that, um, what are our users? I can see different distributions have very different sets of packages. So, Fedora has fewer but has some that we don't have and all the other way around. This is proportional. <coughs> uh, Nixo has packaging a lot, much more than we do, but still we have packaging they don't have, so there seems to be a lot of arbitrariness there. So, what should we package? Uh, obviously, we need all dependencies of programs in that end. So, if Joey decides that Git Index needs library foo, that's a very compelling reason to package foo. That's really the only reason I can think about it's a hard reason. Then, Maybe you want to package very common packages that people, many people want to use. Seems to be reasonable, but that's keep that in mind. Um, maybe you also should provide packages that are hard to compile yourself because they depend on, on C libraries and stuff, which Cabal does not install by itself. So it's confusing for the user to get to. Maybe you should just continue packaging whatever we like to package and what we like to use. <coughs> maybe this arbitrary is not a problem. And maybe there are other reasons. And related to that is basically the question, who are our users, if, if there are any? Um, what kind of... Who would use Haskell packages from Debian? Um, over Haskell packages from using Kabbal install? And are we doing the best for them, or are we doing good stuff for a hypothetical Debian package-only user that doesn't really exist maybe outside our own group? So yeah, that's all the discussion. So the so, uh, question from IRC was uh, the relationship of using stackage and how that fits into packaging here with... Right. Um, stackage is this approach that I just mentioned, where people get notified about breakage and where people, when they sign up for stackage, are encouraged to uh, always compatible with the newest version. Um, 
One attempt would be to say that we want to package all of the package, or that we want to only package stuff that's on package. But I guess, practically speaking, we're just restricting ourselves to other people's decisions. <laughs> we should definitely encourage people to use package, like, uh, developers to use package, because it's taking away problems, or it's solving problems and detecting problems before they get us, when otherwise we would be the first to notice. Um, that answers the question. Yeah, I think the only other question, the other related question is uh, whether there are things Stackage does that, and that, that's part of it. How does it help us? How can we make, make it help the right. job for Debian easier? Um, well, basically by being successful. Uh, I don't think Stackage needs to do anything differently, but it should be more prominent and more visible in the community, in the SD community. So more packages use Stackage or are on Stackage, then you would benefit. I don't have anything right now that would want from Stackage that to be, to be better. Besides more visibility. Uh, yeah? No? Um, to answer that question, I was wondering if package published um, those statistics. Uh, so you would know if a package is more popular than another? Mm -hmm. Good idea, yeah, I haven't thought about that. It does, since a while, so we can downloads here in total in the last three days, so I guess we could. Yeah, we that's, probably, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of workflows to download packages a lot. So Joe is saying that there are a lot of workflows that the package is a lot, but I guess it's because to get the, the relationship to be there. But I'd like to get back to this point of who are our users? What is the, who, are we, who are we doing this work for? Besides the dependencies of binary, I think that's out of the question. So, just generally, in general, wary of packaging things that I don't use myself in Debian. So maybe uh, my personal opinion is it's your fault, but in your favorite library, or maybe like, you know dependencies are things that I use, stuff that I need in Debian because I need it for something that I use myself. Otherwise, I find that I'm. I'm generally not the best maintainer of these packages, so I don't have too much of a personal interest. Yep. This goes into this next slide um, about upgrades, I guess. Um, let's, let's put a radical point of view on the table. What if these only package dependencies, everything needed to get Kabbalah so money, and maybe nothing, or and only things that are educational? that are required for people that are getting started with package, they don't want to worry about the one install yet, like, um, like Gloss, for example, would be an example. It's a, it's a um, graphics library meant for teaching. Um, and nothing else. And then have people use the install. <coughs> that are good here. Would it be improvement? Would it be giving away? Mr. Yeah. Well, this is new on it. Yes. So when I started out writing Ebanx, and I didn't really know much about Haskell either, I had the problem of, while well, I'm targeting Debian, I'm targeting something that I want to be in distributions, but I'm finding all these libraries on package that aren't in Debian, so I do have a chicken and egg there. That's true. Um, in a way, we should be, or we like okay. I guess we believe we are, I'm not sure if you really are, um, curating a set of packages um, that, that is like supposed to be used, so it will be like a selection and people can hopefully rely that packages in Debian are a bit more stable, a bit more usable than packages not in Debian. I don't think we actually live up to that at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it too is that you're looking down the history of Debian Haskell packaging, which you know was more or less unusable a few years ago, and uh, I think not everybody in the habit of doing everything out of Cabal. But I really am a big fan of the packaging minimum set of things I can you can do to bootstrap for a couple of reasons. One is that obviously you're putting a tremendous amount of effort into all this, even with all your automation and tools and everything else. I would love to see you know, your time be spent doing something other than packaging stuff that nobody's ever going to care about. 
but also because, yeah, I mean, I, I pick up that set of habits over the years. I'm like, no, I'm going to go without the ball. And, you know, there, there, there's less and less and less of the different packages that I bother to install, other than, like you say, the core packages that I need to get bootstrapped. Right. And so, um, and, you know, that has its own set of problems. It's, uh, I certainly get that there's a complicated set of questions here. Is it like something that's super easy to answer? But I would say less is maybe more for the end. This is maybe for most of my students and friends. I think they say the voice. Okay, thank you. Um, also, before I let go to Mike, thank you very much. Oh, for this is a lot of work. I really appreciate it. Take off. Personally, I don't want to install anything with the ball, so I uh, package uh, everything we use for better kids. So, uh, I, would, uh, I would hope that other people would do that too. Uh, I don't have to go, but. Uh, I wanted to uh, suggest that somebody take a look at uh, Bloom Filter because it fails to build on all 32 bit platforms. And that ends with the battle of the last question. So, great. Right. Yeah. I guess it probably goes into this question of internet because that's popular. It's not all good. Yeah. Uh, so, I just took a question. So, how does it look um, with stable? So, basically, you're going to, we're going to pick a cut. Slice and tongue. Um, so, does that is that good for the Haskell community or not? Now, I'm not very familiar with Haskell, but maybe that's an argument for just packaging the core set. Um, or does or do Haskell developers just need to track platform testing? Um, yeah, I think Haskell unstable is not very useful for application projects. Maybe again, application only. Um, we have only one minute left. Um, so, I really would like the video team to stay because we have people on IRC, them. but I guess that's hard to that, that demand. So I guess we'll cut it off here. Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Great, in five four minutes. <laughs> um, let's see how often we can do this. <laughs> okay, yeah, please. Uh, just very quickly, sorry. Um, we had this argument about Java uh, earlier in the week about should we just package the, the compiler at the runtime and that's about it, it was useless. And our feeling then was that maybe this wasn't the best for our users. And maybe with Haskell, the best thing for users is just to give them a minimum, bare minimum they need to bootstrap themselves. But our feeling was perhaps this, this sort of move towards don't bother the distribution, just download it. But um, we're doing okay. Um, if Clint, Clint would stop working it, if I would stop working it, we would probably do less good. Maybe if I stop working it and we get to switch to Git, people would, <laughs> I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, so we, we, maybe we can discuss that also in the hallway, um, how to, whether we actually need to actively con get more people to contribute and whether we can make it easier. This is related. Um, I agree that Git has one. It's just that I'm used to this. I have one more minute. I won't get an extension this time, so I'll just, let me just get out what I want to say. Um, it's minor things. I guess if somebody would stand up and do all the conversion to Git and update my scripts, I wouldn't be in the way. But as long as nobody's doing the work, I don't care about enough. I'll keep using that. Um, I guess, at least for a while. But uh, it's not fundamental opposition. It's just, yeah, somebody has to do it. Um, we could do it better on architectures. So maybe that improves as Haskell becomes more, more visible and more important with more products in Haskell. Um, shipping in Debian, maybe then porters will get more interested in helping us there. It's another thing that I'm, I don't, I'm not doing as good as I want to. Oh yeah, Colin, please. I guess that's your, your bullet point. But I guess that's a long minute. Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, as, as one of the few porters who's, who's bothered, the, um, uh, it, it's a very, very high barrier, barrier to entry uh, for porters. Uh, not saying they shouldn't, but uh, we probably shouldn't expect people to turn up and uh, want to fix GHC unless they really enjoy strange intellectual puzzles. Um, so, I mean, I'm all for that, but uh, let's not have expectations too high there because it is very, very difficult. Right, so let's, somebody has to do it. Okay, I think we have to say, thank the video team for giving us the extension and uh, I think I'll finish the official part here and you can just keep sitting and talking. Thank you. Um, uh, goodbye, Sven.